Mr. Taylor, how you doing? Oh. <laughs> how you doing? Right, man. Good man, you yeah, cool. alright? Cool, we're done. We're perfect. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> <laughs> the band has never slowed down and is today even stronger than ever. Um, we are not your kind sounds like a statement. Or like a celebration of that longevity and yeah. strength, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the thing that we noticed is that after all these years, um, you either slip into just a band or you become a part of a culture. And that's kind of where we have found ourselves is we've become uh, uh, a massive part of this culture where you know, people, you're either, you either love Slipknot or you absolutely hate us. And that's fine. That's exactly the way we want it. Um, but the cool thing is, is that because of that culture, we are able to create this environment for our fans to come into and feel safe and feel like, like a family, you know, like people don't understand that this band wasn't built about danger. It was built about inclusion. And that's what we are not your kind is ultimately supposed to be about is the fact that we all have problems we all have this pain that we suffer from this and uh just the pain of life sometimes and it's 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 good to know that there's at least one place one band one place one family that understands you it's know? an inclusion for the excluded exactly and that's exactly it and that's kind of what i wanted to say with we are not your kind it was like there's so many forces outside the, of, of this culture that want to pull us apart. And it's it, the, the way that they try to, to get in and, and divide us is by the color of our skin, the religion that we subscribe to, whether or not we're gay or straight. I mean, all of these things, what, what countries we come from, for God's sakes. It's just like, can we look, we're all different. We get it. How about we find something that pulls us together? How about something that ties, that unites us together? And that's why I said, screw all that. You come to us and you stand with us, no matter where you come from, what color you are, who you love, what you believe, you come and you stand with us and we will turn our backs to each other and face outward and say, we are not your kind. And that's exactly what this is about. Is it fair to say that We Are Not Your Kind is almost like a cinematographic piece of art? It lays on so different moods, atmospheres, contrasts, lights and shadows more than any of your previous records. What do you think about that? Um, I would say that that's probably the best description of it that I've heard yet. And I wish I'd come up with that myself. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you work as, a, as an artist, you know, I'm still trying to learn my craft, you know, is like any painter or musician or, I mean, you, you, you'll never, I don't know, become a master, I don't think, unless, you know, you spend a lifetime trying to achieve it. So for me, it's a learning process. Every time it's a learning process and every time I learn something new, whether it's something good that we should continue to do or something that doesn't work that we should abandon but it's always a work in progress, and I think uh, that's sort of a microcosm of life. I mean, you can t sort of draw that parallel from everything you do in life, you know? I mean, there's always something to be learned, and there's always a, a better way to approach something. So for me, you know, a snapshot in time, like where we're at right now, and hopefully the next time we do this, we can have it go up a level. And, you know, and if it doesn't continue to grow, then, and we're not having fun doing it, then that's when we need to question you know, why it is we're doing it. Uh, some songs are definitive, classic, Slipknot, sheer violence, whereas other pieces are more experimental than yeah. ever, like My Pain, for example. Oh, very um, much so, yeah. Never a Slipknot album has been so adventurous and dramatic, like a roller coaster of emotions and colors. Yeah. What's your opinion about that? No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, it's uh, lyrically, it's probably the deepest that I've gone in quite a long time. Um, uh, about five years ago, I was going through a really, really tough part of my life that had been kind of building towards this. And uh, I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision whether or not I was going to live, whether that meant physically live or, or mentally, or die. And I chose to live and I chose to get myself, extricate myself from a really bad situation. And uh, 
the, the good news is that I'm happier than I have been in years and the good and there's no real bad news about it. I, I had to go through a, a kind of a, a period of finding myself again to rediscover my happiness and, and my, uh, my positivity in life and uh, the things that, that make me uh, glad to be here. And uh, by doing that, I was able to filter out a lot of the pain and the anger that I had because of that situation. And a lot of that has made its way onto this album. So it's really a story of, of not choking on the dark, but finding your way out of that darkness. And uh, the beautiful thing is I had so much wonderful music to play with, you know? It's like not only do we have a lot of this heavy, brutal music, which is really what Slipknot has, has made its foundation, but we've been really able to explore so much more on this album, which is really you know, something that we've been hinting at for a very long time. We finally got to the point where it's like, okay, we have this touchstone of heavy music that we can, we always know where we can go to. Now, let's really build something amazing, creative, artistic, like emotional, and, and show people just how deep this band can go. And I, I think we really, really pulled it off. Uh, I would say that it's from volume three, the subliminal verses that Slipknot has found its right artistic personality and total freedom to explore new territories. How do you find the right balance between potential crowd pleasers such as Unsainted, Critical Darling or Nero Forte and your own desire to experiment? Um, I think we just get lucky with the crowd pleasers while we're experimenting. Because we never set out to like write like a single or a song that would be like a good opener for a set or something that gets the crowd jumping or whatever, you know, I mean, at least I personally don't. Um, when I put an arrangement together, I'm just trying to put something that's pleasing to my ear together. Um, you know, and I listen to a, a very diverse, wide range of music. I listen to everything from, you know, hillbilly honky-tonk country to bands like Entomb to, you know, like classic rock and, you know, like the Beatles and stuff like that. I also listen to like, you know, York and Portishead still to this day and things like that so um, I think when you're trying to come up with something that's pleasing to your ear sometimes you get lucky and you end up with songs like All Out Life or Unsainted or Critical Darling or these songs that you're talking about that translate live well you know I, I never sit down and go I want to write a riff that has like an eight measure breakdown so that I can watch 70,000 people jump at the same time you know what I mean that's like uh, that doesn't really occur to me I just I just want to try to not repeat myself and not become redundant with music that we've done before, you know. You, you can be very proud of this album, you can really feel your touch on the songwriting. Um, Elias' funeral is one of the masterpieces of the album, as well as Spiders and My Pain, which has a, like a, a drone, Brian Eno-like background uh, on the music. Uh, we know your love for Pink Floyd and other atmospheric artists. You've been very involved into the songwriting, more than ever, I guess. Yes, and it's, I love it. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it, but it's now that I'm not spreading myself between two bands, I can put 100% into into this band, and it's it's just good for everybody. You know, I was unhappy when I was doing that, and now that I'm able to really focus, and and you know, I have a really good partner to work with. Clown, you know, you mentioned Spiders and My Pain; those are cl uh, songs that came from Clown's mind that I was able to collaborate with him on fully. Um, you know, you also mentioned Liar's Funeral. To, to me, Liar's Funeral is my favorite song on the record. It's just there's something about that song that's really special to me because. I've never created anything like that before. And it just came together in a way that when I was after, you know, after a few years of working on the demo and then tracking it, I listened to the demo and I'm like, fuck, how did I come up with, I don't even remember how I came up with that or where I was when I wrote like their inversions on the chords and things like that. But when I listened to that song, there's just, I don't know, it's heavy, it's melodic. It has like so many different flavors to it. And I think that that's, that's important, you know, it's like, an artist isn't going to just paint with one or two colors, you know. I mean, there are some artists that do that, and they do very well with it. But uh, this seems to have a lot of different colors and flavors in it, and, and uh, you know, I just hope that I can continue to, to be as creative as a song like that, you know. How have you learned how to compromise with each other on a songwriting level? I mean, it's easy for me, because I'm, 
you know, I used to, the younger me, I used to get so attached to ideas that I used to be like, oh, it has to be that way. But I think that was a, a symptom of spreading myself between two bands and never being able to fully commit to one band. Um, and I think that made me hold things closer to me and be a little bit more stubborn about how I think a part should go. And now when I write an arrangement, it's simply, here's an arrangement that I've put, you know, I've layered guitars, there are drums on it, but it's all suggestions. Once everybody else starts coming in and putting their flavor on it, Mick, Sid, Craig, Clown, Corey, then that's when it really comes to life and becomes you know, a Slipknot song, because they do things on my demos that I've worked, if I worked on a demo for three years, I'm so exhausted on it, I can't look at it or think about it objectively. Mick may come in with fresh ears and be like, oh, I hear this over that, and he may do that, and that may take that part of the song to a completely different direction, or he can play his own thing, and I can play what was originally written, and they work off of each other, and that's sort of a dynamic where we kind of, you know, we, we we need each other to do these things. You and know? that's a sign of maturity and wisdom that you yeah. may not have had 20 years ago. Very true, very true. <laughs> You're about to hit the stage in one hour. Yeah. We, we know you as this gentle, nice and warm bloke. Um, how do you swap into your dark side when you have to get into your character? Oh man, well I tell you, it's pretty easy. Um, it's not as easy as it used to be, to be honest. Um, all the aches and pains and shit <laughs> just kind of built up over the years. Um, you know what it is? It's, it's hearing the music. Hearing the intro snaps me right into shot. You know what I'm saying? Like it, everything can be, I can be having a great day or a, a horrible day, no matter what. And when I hear that intro, something just starts. And it doesn't matter what the intro is to what song or whatever. When I hear that intro, something focuses me. It doesn't even happen when I put the mask on, but when I hear that intro, I know that it's time to pour my heart out and, and really give everything that I've got. You just know? pure adrenaline. Absolutely. And, and that's, it's so special. And it's like, it's, it's unlike anything that I've ever felt in my life, man. It's just a, an all encompassing mindset that uh, to this day is something, it's so powerful that I can't describe it, but it's just, uh, it's amazing. You're all in your mid 40s now. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so am I. Uh, is your stage performance more choreographed or is it still chaos? between the nine of you? Is it still dangerous to be no, on stage as a Slipknot member? Sometimes it is. Um, but you can't, it, to me, if you're, tr if you're going out of your way to try and be something like that, that feels choreographed, you know? If you're trying to go out of your way to be crazy and all that shit, that feels forced. To us, we've always reacted to the music and to each other, you know? That's, that's why you get that feeling of, I don't know who to focus on, I don't know who to watch in the audience, you know, because we're constantly moving, we're constantly doing our thing, we're constantly performing. Um, I think if we were trying to do, if we were trying to act like we did 20 years ago, that would feel very forced, you know. For us, we just do what we come, we do naturally, you know, which is, I mean, we never expect anything crazy to happen. We just go on stage prepared to play the songs and then half the fucking time you know absolute chaos happens and you're just like oh did you see that shit tonight like so it's you know it's it's pretty cool to know that there's no dance going on it's all just improv basically you know the, the only thing that's kind of keeping us together is playing those songs you know at some points of, of your career some of you may have expressed some serious doubts about the band's future are you all now more optimistic about Slipknot's destiny? Um, I'm afraid to be opportunistic about it because in the past we never knew what was going to happen and we always worked it out and we always came together and we always did it. Now I'm afraid that the reverse psychology Murphy's Law thing would, if we say, oh, we're happy, we're great, everything's good, we're going to keep making records forever, then that would mean that we're not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like kind of a reverse psychology thing. So. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I, don't, I can't see the future. I know I, I really enjoy writing music for this band. Um, I enjoy the level that this band's at. All the dues that we've paid over the past 20 years, I'd hate to see all that go to waste. Um, you know, 
we lost a couple of guys along the way, and those guys are still dear to my heart and soul, and we wouldn't be the band we are without them. And for us to just dissolve, it would be a fucking shame, you know? Sean is the last remaining founding member in the band. Uh, after one decade of the classic Nine lineup, uh, Slipknot, as you said, has lost many of its popular figure. At which point would you decide not to go on if other fellows had to leave the band? That's hard to say because, you know, this band is so much more than each one of us. There's, there, it's not about any one of us, it's about the whole. And it's become, in some ways, it's become a culture. Um, you know, we have a huge community of fans and, you know, some of them are probably so diehard that they wouldn't be interested in the band without a few of the original guys left in it. And some of them don't really care as long as it's still the band putting out what the band puts out. And I don't know where to draw that line and I don't know where it makes sense. I think I just would go back to as long as we're enjoying what we're doing and we're creative and we're still growing as artists. It'll always, it'll always be, you know? And if we wake up one day and we're like, why are we doing this? Or we're only doing it for money or we're only doing it for like some other reason that's not, you know, that doesn't have integrity, then there's no point in doing it anymore, you know? One of the main reasons Slipknot is still alive today is because of the many hiatus between your albums, tour cycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a necessary breathe for you all, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How do you all know when it's time to join the circus again? Are there some more reluctant than others? No, I, it's not, uh, I don't think there's any uh, reluctance. I, I think it comes down to the fact that once we've gotten like uh, enough music that feels like we have enough to go into the studio, that's when we start to take it pretty serious. Like this time around, Uh, Clown and Jim got everybody together, man, and really kind of led the led led the charge on that, and came up with this amazing music. Um, that when I heard it, I was like, "Oh my god!" I mean, I was blown away. Like, I I knew instantly that it was better than Point Five, you know. And I loved Point Five for what it was, but this was 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 miles ahead of what we were trying to do you know so it felt good to know that we were expanding past where we had started again and uh you know it, it just it took time to kind of get that stuff together but because they were so focused on building all of this amazing music and art um it was easy to get excited about it you know so there's no real standard um usually they they tend to wait for me to be done with stone sour or whatever but um at the same time we started demoing stuff like right in the middle of my my cycle with stone sour so there was really no uh really no time to to waste basically and uh, by the time i got done i was able to take some time off and be with my family and then i went into the studio with slipknot Don't you sometimes think that this huge circus around you, this whole organization, is too big for a simple, in-your-face, heavy metal band that you used to be? I don't know. Ask Metallica. <laughs> Ask Sabbath, you know? I mean, we're just... Listen, we didn't come first, but we won't be the last, you know? Um, all we're doing is handing down batons to the generation that's going to replace us, you know? And I'm incredibly honored to be a part of that you know there are so many bands that were responsible for us and hopefully we are passing it down to a younger generation so they can experience this as well sometimes you just gotta fucking join the circus boys you know sometimes you just kind of have to get in and go it's gonna be a crazy fucking ride <laughs>